The spark that ignited Spain's brutal civil war occurred when nationalist military forces, upset with the new left-wing government and their reforms, attempted to overthrow them. While the coup fortunately failed, owing to staunch anti-fascist resistance in parts of the country, the coup evolved into a full-scale civil war, splitting the country in two. In the midst of the chaos and violence, however, socialists and anarchists primarily in Catalonia, Aragon and Andalusia took this as an opportunity to transform society through a revolution. Workplaces and factories were seized by the workers, farmland and estates collectivized for the people, and this, along with other social upheaval, saw Western Europe's largest socialist revolution in history. However, with the ongoing conflict and the various left-wing forces vying for power and influence, from moderate socialists to Stalinists, the progress made began to be curbed by more powerful forces, until ultimately the revolution was crushed, not by the right, but by the left. This video will examine the prelude to the start of the civil war, the events that occurred both during and immediately after the fascist coup, and the factors that contributed to the downfall of the revolution. In the 1870s, Spain was briefly a republic, before the army had overthrown it to restore the monarchy. But after several years of military dictatorship under Miguel Primo de Rivera from 1923 to 1930, the Spanish people, along with both left and right wing republican parties, had enough, overthrowing Rivera and establishing the Second Republic. The left wing republican government had come into power in 1931, promising reforms to help the peasants and working classes. But in 1934, when the right republicans took power, a black biennium as described by the Spanish left took power, where rage reforms, reforms against the church and military, and employment reforms had either been revoked, modified, or allowed to lapse. The left reacted negatively to the right's victory in the 1933 elections, although the right had won democratically at the ballot box, with revolts, strikes, and rebellions occurring throughout Spain until the start of the civil war. Anarchism in its various forms entered Spain around the mid-19th century. First the thoughts of Proudhon, then Bakunin, and later Kropotkin, although he was less significant, saw appeal amongst the Spanish peasantry and industrial proletariat. In the words of Canadian anarchist George Woodcock, quote, In Spain, anarchism found the most congenial of all its homes, and for 50 years, until long after it had ceased to be an important movement anywhere else in the world, it gave to Spain an idea that stirred the imagination of the poor and a cause that counted its adherents in hundreds of thousands among the factory workers of Barcelona and the laborers of Madrid, and above all among the peasants of Andalusia and Aragon, of Levant and Galicia. In these favorable circumstances, anarchism developed a moral intensity which made it overleap the merely social and political, until, in many parts of Spain, it assumed the spiritually liberating form of a new religion. The real beginning of the anarchist movement was in 1868, when a revolution exiled Queen Isabella. Over the years, various anarchist organizations formed, and branches of the International Workingmen Association, simply referred to as the International, began to form in Andalusia, Valencia and Catalonia. These organizations saw success in organizing strikes, particularly in Barcelona, and met harsh repression. The anarchists retaliated in kind over the next few decades, with attacks against state institutions and their representatives, as well as innocent people. The Spanish anarchists were largely disorganized and disunified, forming various different cells that had ideological disagreements with one another. The rise of revolutionary syndicalism at the turn of the century in France gave Spain's anarchists a new strategy, and the rise of the CGT, the General Confederation of Labor in France, inspired Spanish anarchists and trade unions to form a new syndicalist federation in Catalonia, called Solidaridad Obrera, in 1908. Horrific repressions occurred in 1909, when Catalan citizens were deliberately drafted into the Rif Wars in Morocco, prompting a general strike which led to open conflict between soldiers, police and workers. In response to this, Spain's libertarians saw the need for a new organization and formed the Confederación Nacional del Trabajo in October 1910, the CNT. Socialism, of course, did not exist exclusively as anarchism, and Marx's wing of socialism, represented by the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, the PSOE, grew as well. However, it did not grow as rapidly, owing to the, its methodical and cautious approach to building an organization. The Marxists decried the anarchists as irresponsible, and the anarchists in turn denigrated them as Spanish Prussians. But with the repressive and autocratic monarchy, combined with the PSOE not officially repudiating it until 1914, saw them fail to grip Catalan's workers and peasants the same way the anarchists did. Union membership swelled during World War I, with salaries and inflation crippling the working poor, whilst industrialists and capitalists feasted over the carcasses of dead working men. The UGT, General Union of Workers, was the PSOE's affiliated union, 
and saw its membership swell to 160,000, while the CNT saw 700,000 members by 1919. After the war and during the years of military dictatorship under Prima de Rivera, the PSOE and UGT deluded themselves into thinking the juntas offered a chance for change in the words of historian Antony Beaver, hoping to form their own constituent Cortes. This delusion led them to attempt a general strike in August 1917, which was brutally repressed, leaving 72 dead, 156 wounded, and 2,000 arrested. This moderate approach stood in stark contrast to the organized spontaneity of the anarcho-syndicalist CNT, who were inspired by the Russian Revolution and became even more militant in the 1920s. Another political force, the Spanish Communist Party, entered the arena in 1921 after a split with the PSOE over the latter's refusal to join the Comintern. Founded by Andres Nin and Joaquin Marin, the former who would become a pivotal figure in the Socialist Revolution in 1936, espoused a revolutionary Marxist worldview. The CNT were courted by the Comintern initially, but when their delegate, Ángel Pastaña, returned to Spain, telling stories of the brutal repression of anarchists in the Soviet Union, they were repulsed, and reaffirmed their loyalty to libertarian communism and syndicalism. While the sister country France saw anarcho-syndicalists defect to the Communist Party in droves, the Spanish anarchists stood strong. Miguel Primo de Rivera was kicked out as Spain's dictator in 1930 after overseeing horrific economic management, with his finance minister Jose Calvo Sotelo pegging the peseta to the gold standard, seeing it lose almost 50% of its value by 1931. The new republic was proclaimed in 1931 after the Pact of San Sebastian was signed in 1930, where almost all of Spain's republican parties, both left and right wing, announced their intention to overthrow the monarchy and establish a functioning and free democracy. But this new government inherited the crises of the old Rivera dictatorship, along with the long-standing questions of Catalan and Basque autonomy. While the CNT and libertarians were supportive of the new republic and preferred it to the monarchy or a military dictatorship, they were still distrustful of the centralized state and frustrated with the reformist approach it took on social and economic matters. Their skepticism proved to be well founded. In 1933, another election saw a right wing Republican government win the majority vote, governed by two parties the Radical Republican Party under Alejandro LaRue and the CEDA led by Jose Maria Gil Robles. LaRue was appointed Prime Minister only because the President, Niceto Alcala Zamora, did not want Robles to occupy the office. During the Restoration, LaRue was a left-wing revolutionary, his leadership style being described almost as demagogic. He and his die-hard supporters were instrumental in sowing chaos and engaging in fierce anti-clerical actions in the early 20th century. In 1906, LaRue called upon his followers with the following exhortation. Young barbarians of today, Enter and sack the decadent civilization of this unhappy country, destroy its temples, finish off its gods, tear the veil from its novices and raise them up to be mothers to virilize the species, break into the records of property and make bonfires of its papers, that fire may purify the infamous social organization. Enter its humble hearts and raise the legions of proletarians that the world may tremble before their awakened judges. Do not be stopped by altars nor by tombs. Fight, kill, die. His attitudes, however, had since moderated, to such a point where he was now in coalition with the CEDA, a far-right Catholic authoritarian party. While LaRue and Robles had won the election, it was almost a year before CEDA representatives were allowed to hold power, as the president was reluctant to grant it to them, afraid of the left's reaction. The progressive reforms implemented by the left Republicans from 31 to 34 were being reversed, including land reform, anti-clerical reforms, taxation reforms, military reforms, and other programs to help the poor in Spain. The left, who had worked so hard over the previous decades and sacrificed so much, were understandably outraged by this, seeing their efforts and achievements disintegrate before their very eyes. To them, this right-wing victory represented a victory of the landowners, the aristocracy, the church, and repressive capitalism. The PSOE underwent a period of significant radicalization under Lago Caballero. Their demands had evolved from simple reforms for the workers to calling for the following, quote, nationalization of the land, dissolution of all religious orders with seizure of their property, dissolution of the army to be replaced by a democratic militia, dissolution of the civil guard. Violent and increasingly revolutionary rhetoric continued to ramp up until October, when Lago Caballero finally announced a general uprising against the government. Terrified of the idea that democracy would be overthrown, the PSOE backed them and joined in. The Asturian Miners' Revolt began on October 5th, with strikes breaking out across the country. 
Caballero had hoped for soldiers and police to join in on the popular uprising, much like what happened in Russia, but this failed. Most strikes were crushed quickly, with those in the northern mining regions of Asturias still holding out. Although in other parts of the country, the CNT had refused to join in on a strike led by socialists and republicans. In Asturias, they had joined the revolutionary coalition, led by socialist Ramon González Peña. The fighting in Asturias between the leftist rebels and state forces, including the military, civil and assault guards, was brutal, with both sides clashing street by street and house by house. By October 7th, General Francisco Franco was ordered to go and crush the rebellion, along with Manuel Gaudet. The miners were bombed from the air and sea, and Moroccan colonial troops were allowed to run rampant and strike fear into the people, murdering prisoners and raping women. By the 19th, the revolt was over, and roughly 1,700 rebels were killed with tens of thousands captured. The military and its auxiliaries lost 260 dead. There were various reactions to this attempted revolution from those across the political spectrum. Revolutionaries like Caballero saw the potential for a future national revolution. Karma heads on the left saw it as a failure. The right, on the other hand, merely confirmed their own beliefs that Spain was headed to a revolution, and that only an emboldened army could crush any hopes of that, much as they had done in Asturias. Franco had emerged as somewhat of a celebrity due to his efficiency and ruthless suppression of the rebellion. The right continued to rule Spain throughout most of 1935. The moderate left under Manuel Azaña began to pull themselves together and formed a united front of parties to contest the elections and hold mass meetings, consisting of the Izquierda Republicana, Union Republicana, and Partido Nacional Republicano. The left were divided, but had become even more radicalized, with Caballero reading Lenin's writings during his prison sentence. A series of corruption scandals broke out throughout that year, culminating in the Strapolo affair which was the death blow to the PRR-CEDA coalition. The Strapolo was a rigged roulette that had been legalized by the conservative government who had been bribed by Rafael Salazar Alonso, the mastermind behind the scheme. When Alonso demanded more money and arranged a raid on the San Sebastian Grand Casino, the Strapolo inventors leaked documents to the government exposing Alonso and the government ministers who had taken bribes. LaRue's nephew was involved in the plot too, and the matter was debated hotly in the Cortes in October that year. LaRue refused to be involved. Phalangist leader José Antonio Primo de Rivera, son of Miguel, proclaimed, Long live the Strapolo, and the conservative government was completely discredited in the eyes of the public. This incident gave President Alcala Zamora the ability to demand LaRue's resignation, and a provisional government under Manuel Portela Valladares, former Catalan governor, was formed ahead of new elections that were called in February 1936. On January 15th, the left and center-left parties formed a popular front to contest the elections. Caballero reluctantly supported the coalition, though he saw it only as a temporary alliance to achieve electoral victory. Caballero summarized his position thusly, quote, Our duty is to establish socialism, and when I speak of socialism, I speak of Marxist socialism. Our aspiration is the conquest of political power. By what means? Those we are able to use. Let it be well understood that by going with the left Republicans, we are mortgaging absolutely nothing of our ideology and action. It is an alliance, a circumstantial coalition, for which a program is being prepared that is certainly not going to satisfy us, but that I say here and now to all those present, and to all those who can hear and read, that everyone, everyone united, must fight to defend. Do not be dismayed, do not be disheartened, if you do not see things in the program that are absolutely basic to our ideology. That way, comrades, after victory, and freed of every kind of commitment, we shall be able to say to everyone that we shall pursue our course without interruption until the triumph of our ideals. The anarchists of the CNT, forever opposed to the participation in electoralism, refused to join the Popular Front government. However, their leaders understood the pragmatic need for a left-wing victory in these elections, and encouraged the over a million members to vote in these elections. The CNT hadn't reached this decision lightly, and fiercely debated their position ahead of these elections. On the one hand, some believed backing the Popular Front and suspending the anti-electoral campaign would provide the government with the means to attack the anarchists. Others believed that abstaining would allow the right to take power, attacking both them and the reformist left as well. Thus, the CNT-FAI agreed to support but not participate in the Popular Front government, proclaiming the following to their supporters. If the working class abstains from voting this time, election victory will go to the fascist right. Should they succeed, we would have to take to the streets to fight them with all available weaponry. Should the working class vote this time, the right, backed by the military, will revolt before six months are up. So we do not say to you that you should not vote, but nor do we tell you that you should vote. Let each individual act as his conscience dictates. 
but you should all be ready for fighting in the streets, no matter whether it is the right who win or the left. In return for their support, the anarchists demanded shipments of arms to crush the anticipated right-wing coup and the release of their political prisoners. With nothing guaranteed, three of the most prominent anarchists, Deruti, Ascaso and Oliver, used their influence to convince the CNT to abandon any anti-electoral campaign. Fortunately for the left, they were able to secure a victory in the 1936 elections. The Popular Front won 285 seats, the Centre 57 and the Right 51, although the popular vote was much closer, with the left gaining a 1.5% lead over its rivals. This was due to a voting system that did not give proportional representation on a vote-by-vote -vote basis. However, during the 1933 elections, the right wing had benefited from that exact same system. Everyone on the left was aware of the political ramifications of their victory, namely a military uprising led by conservative generals. Prime Minister Manuel Azaña, a controversial figure to the left, but one that was faithful to the Republic, understood the danger the military posed and began taking measures against them. From the 22nd to the 28th of February, top positions in the military were purged of right-wing officers. Three army inspector generals were fired and replaced with politically loyal officers. Francisco Franco was exiled to the Canary Islands and Manuel Godard the Balearics. The foundations for the revolution had begun to be laid at this point. The left, although achieving a marginal electoral victory, acted as if they had received an overwhelming mandate to carry out their revolution. Political prisoners were freed before a government amnesty, land began to be collectivized in parts of the Spanish countryside, and small-scale seizure of workplaces had occurred in other parts of the country. From February 20th to July 19th, according to historian and anarchist Stuart Christie, 113 general strikes and 228 partial stoppages occurred throughout the country. While the new government was ruled overwhelmingly by moderate parties, the right acted as if the country had become Bolshevized overnight, plotting with the military for their eventual insurrection. Franco was flown in secret to Morocco to command the Army of Africa, and generals within Spain, including Emilio Mola, Gonzalo Caipo de Llano, Joaquin Van Hul, Sebastian Pozas, and Manuel Godet put their plot into action. While Azania's exile of these officers kept them away from key governmental positions, it unfortunately also allowed them to plot in secret, far away from Republican loyalists' prying eyes. The moderate leadership, while concerned about a military uprising, severely underestimated its possibility of success, remaining blindly optimistic about their ability to crush it if it were to occur. As the day of the coup, the 17th of July, approached, a series of political assassinations took part, and despite the urging of socialist and communist representatives to arrest and purge more of the military and take more active measures against the putschists, nothing meaningful was done. Thus, the die was cast, and on that fateful day in July, the Spanish Civil War would begin. On July 17th, the existing social, political and economic strife in Spain boiled over into a civil war. Rebel military officers began uprisings across the country in an attempt to overthrow democracy. Despite warnings from left-wing ministers and even anti-fascist officers in the military, the Republic's leadership had failed to take decisive action to avert a coup. Some areas of the country, such as right-wing strongholds like Pamplona, fell to the rebels, while others, such as Madrid and Barcelona, were firmly in the hands of the left. I've covered the rebellion in greater detail in a previous video, so I will not rehash the particulars of the putsch, as this video is more focused on the social revolution aspect. The army and civil and assault guards were split roughly 50-50 between siding with the Republic or with the rebels. The navy and air force were firmly Republican. The coup ostensibly failed, however, as the nationalists were unable to control the government, but the Republic had failed to crush it effectively, and thus the failed coup transformed into a full-scale civil war. The CNT's warnings of a military coup had come true. Before the coup had even begun, CNT informants had warned their leadership of an imminent uprising. The General Atat had requested a meeting with the CNT, and anarchist representatives urged the government to provide the arms they promised so that they may crush the insurgency. Lewis Companies and Casares Quiroga hesitated, fearing the consequences of arming the anarchists. As Barcelona Police Chief Federico Escafet put it, quote, to arm the CNT represented an immediate or later danger for the Republican regime in Catalonia, of equal danger as a military rebellion. These armed elements, who undoubtedly would provide invaluable assistance in the struggle against the rebels, could also endanger the existence of the Republic and the Generalitat. In other areas of the country, socialist and anarchist workers stormed government buildings, demanding they be armed to help to crush the insurgency. In areas where the government obliged, such as in Jaén, any risk of a rebellion disappeared. In others, where local governors feared provoking the military or guards into action, they quickly fell to the fascists. On the night of the 18th, 
the CNT and UGT declared a nationwide general strike. Workers began to dig up arms that they had hidden after the failed Asturian rebellion, and in the streets and promenades, workers erected and manned barricades, prepared to fight the rebels. In the midst of all this, particularly in Barcelona, the anarchists had begun their own uprising, a social revolution. They had seized the Barcelona telephone exchange and a working class insurrection had taken place. Factories were seized by the workers across Catalonia, farmland collectivized by the people, and Kropotkin-esque libertarian communes sprung up across the region. A military rebellion led by Manuel Godet was poorly organized and executed, and anarchist militants, civil and assault guards, socialists and military personnel were able to quickly and ruthlessly crush it. Godet was arrested and later executed in August. The institutions of the state had ceased to exist with the large-scale defections to the rebels, and so while the government still existed, it could do little more than observe the revolutionary chaos. As leader of the POUM, the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, Andres Nin said, quote, The government does not exist. We collaborate with them, but they can do no more than sanction whatever is done by the masses. In this atmosphere of revolution, the left had acted immediately to purge society of their enemies. Solidaridad Obrera, the CNT's newspaper, declared that proven fascists were to be assassinated. Conservative officers, politicians, clergymen, the bourgeois, and others were killed by leftists throughout Catalonia. An anarchist youth manifesto declared the following, quote, For the revolution to be a fact, we must demolish the three pillars of reaction, the church, the army, and capitalism. While repression was carried out in a largely decentralized fashion, it is inaccurate to portray the wave of violence in July as a blanket repression. Factory owners, landowners, and employers who were known to have treated their workers well were spared any harm, and in some cases, when their workplace was restructured along socialist lines, they were welcomed into the new business. Workers' committees, the germ of proletarian power, assumed control over political and economic life across the country, particularly in Catalonia. Local courts were supplanted by revolutionary tribunals who dispensed justice as they saw fit. The Popular Front government attempted to establish its own popular tribunals to lend some legitimacy to the executions, but even then, the government was unable to establish law and order. When the trial of Rafael Salazar Alonso, a former radical Republican minister and figure involved in the Strapolo affair, was to have his sentence commuted, Tribunal President Mariano Gomez informed Andalesio Prieto that there would be a terrible mutiny if he was not executed, and that Alonso would have been shot anyway. Prieto then reversed his decision and sentenced Alonso to death. This demonstrates how at this point, the government, much as Nin said, could only sanction the will of the masses and exercise no authority of their own. Banks were seized and deposit boxes raided. Prisons were emptied to release friendly political prisoners, but along with them came the common law criminals who used the chaos to continue their activities. Some donned the red and black of the CNT, whose recruitment standards were so lax at this time that even phalangists joined them to escape persecution. Many on the left, and in particular the anarchists, had a vile hatred of the church. Hundreds were torched or seized for secular uses in the immediate aftermath of the coup. Solidaridad Obrera reported that in the province of Tarragona, the churches in all the villages have been set ablaze. Only those buildings that could be used for the benefit of the people have been kept, but not those that were a serious danger after burning. Many churches have been converted into communal warehouses, as well as into garages for the anti-fascist militia. Paul Blanchard, a secular activist and critic of Catholicism, points out the phenomenon of church burnings in Spain at this time. That while Spain was known as this intensely Catholic country, with the Spanish Inquisition and all that, Blanchard writes, The nation which claims to be the most Catholic nation in the world has probably murdered more priests and nuns and burned more convents and schools than any other nation in the world. The church has been victimized because it has been regarded as part of the ruling structure of political power. For almost 200 years, the advocates of political democracy in Spain have been automatically anti-clerical, and the defenders of dictatorship have tended to be pro-Catholic. Thousands of clerics and members of religious orders were killed and more fled. Foreign missions such as the Chilean embassy housed 15,000 people. Many of Rosania's ministers, whom he had guided from 1931 to 33, fled the country, which greatly angered and frustrated him. Power was no longer controlled in the hands of the central government. Historian Burnett Bolton described the transformation of power thusly, quote, Shorn of the repressive organs of the state, the liberal government of José Guerrero possessed nominal power, but not power itself, for this was split into countless fragments and scattered in thousands of towns and villages amongst the revolutionary committees that had instituted control over post and telegraph offices, radio stations, and telephone exchange, 
organized police squads and tribunals, highway and frontier patrols, transport and supply services, and creating militia units for the battlefronts. In short, nowhere in Spain did the cabinet of José Guerrero exercise any real authority, as prominent adherents of the anti-Franco camp have amply testified. The economy was not spared by the far-reaching grasp of the social revolution, where the left was able to maintain control and defeat the coup, large chunks of the economy were seized by either the UGT or CNT. Even the Comintern, whose interests would downplay the revolution for diplomatic reasons, was forced to acknowledge its scope. Mikhail Koltsov, a leading journalist and Stalin's personal agent in Spain, estimated that roughly 18,000 industrial and commercial enterprises were seized by unions of the state, including 2,500 in Madrid and 3,000 in Barcelona. Collectivization spread throughout the countryside, landed properties were seized, with some collectivized and others divided amongst the peasantry. The people had learned from the previous failures of reformism that they could not wait for the government to hand land to them and had to seize it for themselves. From railways and buses to bottle factories and breweries, workers' committees and councils control the economic life of Catalonia and much of Spain. In the fruit and vegetable markets, for example, dealers and commission merchants were done away with. However, they were still allowed to join the new collective as a paid worker. In the dairy industry, the CNT's Food Worker Union closed 40 pasteurization plants for being unhygienic, operated only nine, and established 150 distribution centers. Healthcare was also socialized, with the CNT forming a health workers union and opening up hospitals and clinics. The economic revolution was not confined to the big bourgeoisie, with small businesses also seeing transformation in their structures. In Madrid, small shoemakers and cabinet makers were collectivized, and in Valencia, almost all plants were seized by the CNT and UGT. The Valencian orange trade, a huge source of income for Spain, was collectivized, with a network of 270 committees managing the production, distribution and exportation of Spain's oranges. While many small business owners acquiesced their property as workers instead of employers in the hope that the fervor would subside, they were soon to be disappointed. As Solidaridad Obrera put it, quote, Those small employers of labor who are a little enlightened will easily understand that a system of producing goods in small plants is not efficient. Divided effort holds back production. Operating a tiny workshop with handicraft methods is not the same as operating a large plant that utilizes all the advances of technology. If our aim is to do away with the contingencies and insecurities of the capitalist regime, then we must direct production in a way that ensures the well-being of society. On the other hand, whilst animosity towards the petite bourgeoisie was prevalent amongst the working classes, it was not universal. Secretary of the CNT's Commercial Employees Union, Juan Ferrer, recalls the following event. Very often, the business owner would address the assembly of workers, practically bringing tears to everyone's eyes with the story of the sacrifices he had made to build up the firm, only now to see threatened with collectivization. In these cases, I always suggested to the assembly that he be made the managing director, since the works council had to appoint one anyway. In the agricultural sector, the scale of collectivization was enormous. In Aragon, 500 collectors were organized, 900 in the Levant and 300 in the Senna region. Regional federations were organized to coordinate and distribute product. Agricultural collectivization was considered a pillar of the revolution and was welcomed by the beleaguered farm workers, not so much by the owners. The CNT feared individual farmers with their own land holdings would lead to the formation of large properties and exploitation and insisted that collectivization of industry and agriculture would prevent this. These village collectors regarded themselves as independent communes, with the land being worked on communally rather than being divided into plots. Standards of living, while varied, improved overall from the pre-collectivization days. What accompanied this was a concerted effort to improve education, address illiteracy, and create medical services in the spirit of the pursuit of scientific agriculture and mechanization. While most of the collectors were embraced voluntarily, especially in Aragon, there was an element of coercion in the form of armed militiamen from Catalonia. As Bolletin points out, quote, The fact is that many small owners and tenant farmers were forced to join the collective farms before they had had an opportunity to decide freely. Although the libertarian movement tended to minimize the factor of coercion in the development of collectivized agriculture or even to deny it altogether, it was, on occasions, frankly admitted. However, with the rise of the revolution comes its downfall. The existing political rivalries amongst the left and the meddling of Stalinists would begin to undermine its achievements long before the fall of the Republic in 1939. The entire social atmosphere changed in Republican Spain and especially in revolutionary Catalonia, 
Almost all aspects of political, social and economic life had been altered drastically in a very short period of time. Even language and the dynamics of social class had been altered, as Orwell writes in homage to Catalonia upon arriving in December 1936. Every shop and cafe had an inscription saying it, that it had been collectivized. Waiters and shop walkers looked you in the face and treated you as an equal. Servile and even ceremonial forms of speech had temporarily disappeared. Nobody said senor or don or even usted. Everyone called everyone else comrade and tu and said salud instead of buenos dias. Tipping was forbidden by law. Almost my first experience was receiving a lecture from a hotel manager for trying to tip a lift boy. There were no private motor cars, they had all been commandeered, and all the trams and taxis and much of the other transport were painted red and black. While much had been achieved in the first few months of the Civil War, the players on the Republican side soon laid the foundations for the revolution's untimely demise. Communism and republicanism in Spain, as Orwell points out, was fundamentally anti-revolutionary. The left leadership was made up of bourgeois reformists or career politicians, too afraid to implement the policies they promised. The fervor of the anarchists, to many of them, was as much of a concern as the fascist threat. The communists had been a strong proponent of a centralized conventional army, which was treated with suspicion by left socialists like Lago Caballero, and even more so by the CNT. The PUM, a largely irrelevant political force outside of Catalonia, but with a significant presence inside it, was opposed to the idea, and formed its own militia, one that George Orwell would famously serve in. Part of this desire by the communists was to attract more volunteers, but also to impress foreign powers by portraying the republic as a conventional state with a conventional army. Hopefully, this would also convince Britain and France to lend military aid to a fellow democratic nation in need. This was a delusion, as neither Britain nor France were willing to lend aid to the Republic. Although France was governed by a left-wing Popular Front government under Leon Blum, they had been fighting with far-right militants in the French streets, and there was a threat of a fascist coup and potential civil war. Although providing limited aid initially, fear of provoking Germany and Italy, along with Britain pressuring Blum not to send any aid to the Spaniards, quickly stopped that. The conservative elite in Britain, fearful of Bolshevism and with mixed feelings towards fascism, meant that the country would have never given aid to a left-wing government at war. All the while, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy were funneling arms, equipment and troops to the nationalists. The only aid the Republic would receive would come from the Soviet Union, and thus the Spanish Communist Party, a minor force with little domestic support, had a disproportionate amount of influence. The leadership of the CNT FAI anticipated a long war and felt that international support was necessary to achieve victory. To this end, they tried to calm down their militant members and collaborate with their bourgeois allies. Threats to deny the anarchists with both arms and currency to procure arms put them under further pressure to enter the Catalonian Generalitat. This move by the CNT FAI leadership was the ultimate betrayal of their anarcho-syndicalist principles and turned them, in the words of Stuart Christie, from a great working class instrument into just another oligarchic reformist socialist institution. Another reason prompting the anarchist acquiescence was the situation on the front line. In September, faced with nationalist military successes which almost saw the towns of Talavera and Irún fall, the new government led by Ilago Caballero seemed like an attractive proposition even to the anarchists. Another problem they faced was that the most militant and revolutionary members, those that saw the war and revolution as inseparable, were isolated on the front lines, while those that prioritized the war first were in the rear, where they could control the press and publish their messages. Caballero, although a status, extended an olive branch to the CNT, asking them to join a central government, which they refused. The CNT responded with a counteroffer that they form a National Defense Council, headed by Caballero and containing five members from the CNT and UGT, four liberal republicans and no communists, but this was rejected by him. In Catalonia, however, the CNT joined the Generalitat on September 26th, with three members taking government posts. While anarchists worldwide were shocked by the CNT's betrayal of their principles, the FII responded with the following to the international libertarian movement. We cannot destroy the government, because as soon as we brought down the governments in Madrid and Barcelona, the entire world would recognize Burgos, capital of Franco's fascist government. Why not? An anarchist Spain without a government, without judicial responsibility, non-existent from the viewpoint of international rights, a revolutionary Spain that threatened all the established interests of capitalism, of the small and big bourgeoisie, of reaction and the democracies, all the European powers would oppose it. Although the CNT insisted to its supporters, both domestically and abroad, that it was opposed to governments and states, their participation in the Generalitat in September, alongside the UGT and Stalinist PSUC, told a different story. 
but as the previous quote indicates, it does not seem like the anarchists had much of a choice. The union leadership had two main factions, the reformers who wanted compromise and the purists who wanted to stay true to their ideology and refuse participation in government. Ultimately, the reformers won. On October 23rd, a pact of unity was signed with the UGT and PSUC in Catalonia, which saw the spontaneous collectivization process that had broken out in July now come under control of the state. The PRUM was outwardly critical of both these moves by the anarchists, and Andres Nin was acutely aware of how Stalinists were able to infiltrate key positions of power and control government regardless of their popularity amongst the people. Historian Anthony Beaver describes the situation as the, quote, first major step in the loss of anarchist power in Catalonia. In November, Caballero once again asked the CNT to join the Madrid government. Their leadership requested the ministries of finance and war along with three others, but were granted health, justice, industry, and commerce. Communist influence grew during the Madrid siege beginning in November. The government had fled to Valencia despite the opposition of the four anarchist ministers in the central government. The absence of a central authority saw the re-establishment of local resistance militias. Even the communists, who opposed such an organization in favor of a traditional military, did a complete 180 and encouraged the formation of syndicate militias. The environment in Madrid at this time was very similar to that of Barcelona in July. CNT barbers, railway men and tailors formed battalions. School masters and graphic artists formed units as well. Buildings were requisitioned and the Ritz Hotel was commandeered and turned into a canteen to help refugees and the homeless. A military junta was established, but Marcel Rosenberg, the Soviet ambassador to Spain, forbade the Poon from participating in it. The communists continued to exert their influence, purging the civil and assault guards and replacing them with their own 5th Regiment. They conducted killings of prisoners, some of whom were nationalists, an action condemned by the anarchist director of prisons, Melchor Rodriguez. But very few others dared to criticize the Stalinists at this time. While ideologically, communism and Stalinism are distinct from one another, I've used the terms interchangeably as in this context, the PCE, Spanish Communist Party, were organs of the Comintern, guided by and loyal to Stalinism. Things looked grim for the defenders, and the nationalists had reached the outskirts of the city. A usually cautious Franco even told his staff to prepare to attend mass on the 7th in the city. Fortunately, the defenders experienced a bit of luck. After knocking out an Italian tank on the 7th, militiamen searched the commander's body, finding a complete set of plans for the fascist attack. The coordinators of Madrid's defense thus shifted their force concentrations in light of this new information. The defenders were successful, and even the Army of Africa, hitherto considered invincible by the Republicans, had experienced a major defeat, especially in the house-to-house -house fighting in working-class suburbs. The 11th International Brigade, formed by the Comintern, who to their credit fought with suicidal bravery and courage, represented only a minority of the total forces fighting on the Republican side in Madrid. The Communists nevertheless achieved a propaganda coup that overemphasized their significance and participation. Another major loss for the anarchists was the death of one of their most charismatic and legendary figures, Buenaventura Duruti, killed most likely by accidental friendly fire. By the end of November 1936, the Battle of Madrid had evolved into a siege, with Franco ordering mass bombardment of the city, replacing the costly infantry assaults from earlier. In the midst of this, the communists exercised their force, gradually replacing workers' committees with centralized control, and their secret police continued to arrest political opponents. The communists had also begun to court the middle classes and disillusioned peasantry to grow their ranks. One socialist writer wrote that, quote, the Republican middle class, surprised by the moderate tone of communist propaganda and impressed by the unity and realism which prevailed in this party, flocked in great numbers to join its ranks. Party organs in Madrid and Catalonia urged socialists and anarchists to respect the property of small business owners and tradesmen. The communists organized 18,000 middle class proprietors into the Federación Catalana de Grimes y Entidades de Pequeños Comerciantes e Industriales in Catalonia to protect them from the collectivization drive of the anarchists. It must be noted that the communist appeal to the middle class were not altruistic but purely pragmatic in nature, in an effort to gain whatever ally they could to grow their influence. Acting in the words of Lenin, conquering the enemy could only be done, quote, by taking advantage of every, even the smallest opportunity of gaining a mass ally, even though this ally be only temporary. Those who do not understand this do not understand a particle of Marxism, or of scientific modern socialism in general. While the communists may have been following Lenin's teachings, their actions were explicitly counter-revolutionary. 
The enemy in this case was not the bourgeoisie, fascist or religious order in Spain, but rather socialist and anarchist comrades interested in bettering the conditions of the working classes. The communists attacked the collectivization drives in the countryside and their rhetoric saw support from some farmers, especially those who had been maltreated by the anarchists and socialists early on in the war because of their Catholicism or suspected fascist sympathies. Dolores Ibaruri, known as La Passionaria, explicitly admits their party's actions and intentions at the outset of the war in the following proclamation to the Central Committee. The revolution that is taking place in our country is the bourgeois democratic revolution that was achieved over a century ago in other countries, such as France, and we communists are the frontline fighters in the struggle against the obscurantist forces of the past. Although later in this proclamation, Ibaruri declares that the communists were fighting side by side with republicans, socialists and anarchists, it showed from the outset that the PCE was to the distraught middle classes, the defenders of private property, order and government. Nin's party, the PUM, were for the first time openly attacked by the Stalinists. In their paper La Bataille, the PUM declared accurately that, quote, Stalin's concern is not really the fate of the Spanish and international proletariat, but the protection of the Soviet government in accordance with the policy of pacts made by certain others. In retaliation, Soviet advisers accused the PUM of acting in the interests of international fascism and cut pay and supplies to PUM militiamen on the Madrid front, forcing them to disband and their members filter into the CNT and UGT's militias. As 1937 progressed, the CNT ministers found themselves yielding more and more to their opponents. The CNT Minister of Industry, Juan Piero, knew that Britain and France would never reverse their non-interventionist stance, but acknowledged that the left's victory relied on them. Some historians argue that communist pressure and fear of provoking the French and English convinced even Lago Caballero to respect republican legality. Caballero and the anarchists, especially the reformist wing of the CNT, began to acquiesce to the communist line that the war should come first and the revolution after. Workers' committees came under attack, with the communists advocating for their disillusion, and even Peiro suggesting that they interfered with government functions. As early as September 1936, the Republican government had been rebuilding the state organs that had previously been eviscerated by the July coup. The Civil Guard had been purged and reformed into the National Republican Guard. The Carabineers had been increased from 15,000 to 40,000 members in April. Simultaneously, Caballero's government began curbing the independent workers' militias responsible for policing, integrating them into a vigilance militia under the Ministry of the Interior. Patrols that refused to join were hampered in their efforts. Comintern agents began constructing a disciplined and centralized army, a popular army, and began infiltrating their members into key positions, such as Lieutenant Colonel Antonio Cordon as head of the Technical Secretariat of the War Ministry, a man responsible for pay, promotion, supplies and personnel. By March 1937, according to a report to Moscow, the communists controlled 27 out of 38 key command positions of the Central Front, with three more held by sympathetic officers. Marcel Rosenberg, acting almost like a Russian viceroy, urged Caballero to execute General Asensio Torado for incompetence. Ironically, upon returning to Moscow in February, Rosenberg himself was executed as part of Stalin's purges. Caballero tried to prevent communist recruiting drives in the army and police forces, but to no avail. He could only count on the four anarchist ministers in his cabinet for support against the communists, as the other republican parties were willing to collaborate. The pressure began to build up to May, the presence of the government's organs in Catalonia began to grow, and the battle lines were being drawn. The PUM's presence in Madrid was all but destroyed, but, while still smaller than the CNT, they were a significant force in Barcelona, and as May approached, the tensions would bubble and boil until they exploded. Several events occurred in April which foreshadowed a showdown between the Republican and anarchist forces in Catalonia. On April 16th, companies appointed Juan Comerera as the Minister of Justice, a member of the PSUC. The PUM were especially nervous about this, as Comerera had in the past advocated for liquidating Nin's party. On the 25th, Juan Negrin's Carabineros seized frontier posts on the Pyrenean frontier, which had henceforth been manned by the anarchists. Small-scale clashes had occurred between Republican and anarchist forces, and the CNT paper Solidaridad Obrera was closed that same day. As May Day approached, the CNT tried to reconcile with the UGT and celebrate the day as part of a joint demonstration, but this was cancelled over fears it would raise tensions. Orwell points out the perplexing situation in homage to Catalonia, quote, So nothing happened on the 1st of May. It was a queer state of affairs. 
Barcelona, the so-called revolutionary city, was probably the only city in non-fascist Europe that had no celebrations that day. The CNT had earlier in April announced their intention to no longer concede to the reformists and communists, and Nin welcomed this stand. Attempts were made to disarm the anarchist militias in the streets, and the chasm between the forces of revolution and counter-revolution began to widen until open warfare broke out. The Catalan Generalitat attempted to seize the telephone exchange on the 2nd of May with three trucks of assault guards, but resistance from the anarchists who controlled it turned the conflict into a siege. Workers around Barcelona began tearing up the cobblestone streets to erect barricades. Although the CNT controlled 90% of Barcelona, its leadership did not want to escalate the conflict for fear of provoking a civil war within a civil war. More militant anarchists, such as the Friends of Deruti and the Pum, drafted a pamphlet advocating to violently put down the counter-revolution which was denounced by the CNT FAI. The spirit of the revolution which had broken out on May 2nd had now disappeared, with the CNT making a pact with the government to stop the fighting. Part of the agreement made government forces promise not to commit reprisals. However, when assault guards and carabineros arrived on the 7th, they enacted revenge on the libertarians. Communist propaganda churned up increasingly ridiculous fantasies claiming that gangs of Trotskyite bandits were robbing the people and that there were links between the Gestapo and the Catalonians. The CNT and Pum's influence had virtually collapsed by this point, and Comorera had introduced new tribunals that tried and convicted its members. Their newspapers were all but banned and unable to effectively counter increasingly ridiculous Stalinist attacks. Trotsky himself, although with no direct links to the events in Spain, wrote of the May events the following. If the proletariat of Catalonia had taken power in May 1937, it would have found support in the whole of Spain. The bourgeois Stalinist reactionaries would not have even been able to find two regiments with which to crush the Catalan workers. In the territory occupied by Franco, not only the workers but also the peasants would have aligned themselves with the Catalan proletariat. They would have isolated the fascist army and started an irresistible process of disintegration inside it. Under these circumstances, it is doubtful whether a foreign government would have risked sending regiments to the flaming soil of Spain. Intervention would have become materially impossible, or at least extremely dangerous. Rhetoric against the Pum continued to ramp up, and in spite of Trotsky himself denouncing them, the Stalinist press continued to level accusations that they were Trotskyists. The Communists spoke to Caballero, urging him to crack down on the Pum, which he refused, and was backed by the anarchists and two of his old socialist colleagues. Lago Caballero found himself increasingly isolated and found it impossible to govern with the strength of communist influence, until he was forced to resign on May 17th. Juan Negrin was now the new Prime Minister. Negrin was an authoritarian who let the Stalinist terror continue unabated. Under his leadership, the Pum were outlawed on June 16th, and its leader, Andres Nin, was kidnapped, tortured, and executed on June 21st. In spite of the horrific treatment he was subjected to, Nin refused to turn in any of his comrades, nor admit to the ludicrous accusations he was supposed to have done. Negrin did nothing to question the Stalinist narratives, which even Azania considered too novelesque, only further legitimizing their propaganda. It is clear that by July 1937, the Catalan Revolution was all but over. While the CNT FAI still existed, its power and influence had been all but neutered and its chief ally, the Pum, had been crushed. The FAI began a massive recruitment drive and attempted to reorganize, but this meant opposition amongst its ranks. The Friends of Deruti continued to challenge the embroilment of the CNT's leadership in collaboration with the central government, where they had now become, in the words of Stuart Christie, part of the authority system which, as anarchists, they had previously repudiated. CNT representatives in the Catalan and central governments were fired and the Defence Council of Aragon was dissolved in August 1937. From the second half of 1937 to 1938, Negrin began to dissolve the agrarian collectives and place them under state control, along with chipping away at worker control over businesses and factories, all in the name of wartime necessity. Thousands of anarcho-syndicalists were arrested for being undisciplined elements, and the CNT leadership offered virtually no resistance. The situation on the battlefield got no better for the Republic. The fascists were threatening Bilbao, and the Republican offensive to relieve pressure only delayed them by one to two weeks at most. Fernando Claudin, a prominent Spanish Communist Party member, later said of his party's policies, quote, By fulfilling the directives of Moscow to eliminate Lago Caballero from the premiership and to unleash the repression against the Pum, the PCE assumed responsibility for deepening the divisions within the working masses and greatly weakening the Republic's ability to fight. The Communists, perplexingly, now attempted to court the workers of the CNT. Lago Caballero, out of politics but still within the leadership of the UGT, was determined to continue his struggle against the Stalinists. The Republic was crumbling from within. 
In November 1937, Negrin transferred his government from Valencia to Barcelona. With it came government ministers requisitioning estates and splendid houses, which angered the Catalan working class. Even the local Catalan authorities, which had collaborated with the central government in repressing the anarchists in May, had launched endless protests against their treatment by Negrin's government. In August, tanks and planes of the Popular Army rolled into Barcelona, and the Republican government now had complete control. CNT officers were seized and destroyed, anarchists were arrested, and collectives were abolished. Enrique Lista was in command of the repression, and the CNT's failure to criticize his harsh repression only further widened the rift between the leadership and membership of the trade union. The Republic was ceding ground bit by bit as the war progressed. Franco's forces seemed to enjoy success after success against an increasingly demoralized and disillusioned Republican army. Republican territory had been cut in half in March 1938, with the Nationalists driving to the Mediterranean. They launched the ill-fated Battle of the Ebro to try and reunite their territory, but failed. Republicans had also secretly hoped of an anti-fascist alliance with Western Europe, but Neville Chamberlain's Munich Agreement dashed any hopes of that. In the first two months of 1939, Franco launched an offensive into Catalonia, with Barcelona falling on January 26th. Britain and France shortly thereafter recognized Franco's government and it was all but over for the Republic, which was eventually defeated in April. After the defeat of the Republic, anarchist leader and minister Diego Abad de Santillan made the following acknowledgement, quote, We knew that our cause could not triumph without winning the war. We sacrificed the revolution, not understanding that this sacrifice entailed renouncing the real goals of the war. The Catalan Socialist Revolution of July 1936, prompted by the fascist coup led by Francisco Franco, began in earnest. Workplaces were seized by the workers, agrarian plots collectivized, and fascist insurrections put down by the working class. The coup, however, evolved into a civil war, and as it prolonged, internal strifes and division took root and exacerbated. The anarchists, outnumbered and subject to the increasing pressure from their bourgeois and communist allies, were forced to make compromise after compromise to maintain and preserve the fruits of their struggle. However, the pressure proved to be too much to handle, the compromise only delaying the inevitable, and the anarchists were effectively deprived of any political influence and power as early as May of 1937, long before the fall of the Republic in 1939. With the downfall of the Catalan Revolution, the hopes of millions of the Spanish working class were dashed, and the repressive rule of Negrin's government, heavily influenced by the communists, paved the way to a dark era of fascist dictatorship under Francisco Franco. The anarchists had betrayed their principles in the delusion that they could protect the achievements of the revolution, and paid dearly for it. Thanks for watching.